Greetings to all participants. We thank all the participants for staying with us. Now we are going to start our second, our second block of this lecture. For us, it's an honor to have you as an audience. The following two lectures will discuss the compensatory mechanisms of sagittal imbalance and the clinical applications of sagittal balance analysis. Remember that we, that we will be hosting a case discussion at the end of this course to integrate the notions discussed during the day. Stay tuned with us. We will start our third lecture by Dr. Jorge Torres about the compensatory mechanisms in sagittal imbalance. Remember to write your questions in the Q&A panel at the inferior part of your Zoom screen. At the end of this lecture, we will have 15 minutes Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Feel free to continue. Greetings again to all the participants and assistants. So we start our third lecture, Compensatory Mechanisms to Sagittal Imbalance. So as we saw previously, uh, from a biomechanical perspective, there are some objectives as posture. To maintain gravity line over the feet in order to stay upright, the center of gravity over the base of sustentation, maintain horizontal gaze, lower the contact force, therefore lowering the forces that develop into degenerative spine disease, and lowering muscle workload, which is probably one of the most important biomechanical objectives of posture. For this, force equilibrium is required, and there's going to be an equilibrium between flexion or kyphosing forces and extension or lower dosing forces. And there are going to be pathologic processes that are going to tend toward flexion or extension. The vast majority, majority of, these pro, of these problems or pathologic processes tend to be a kyphosing event, be it neuromuscular, neurodegenerative disease, trauma like vitreal fractures, tumors with instability, developmental diseases like Schuerman disease, or iatrogenic, which is uh, probably currently one of the most important causes, post-laminectomy or post-arthrodesis uh, and kyphosing events. But there are also some more rarely uh, hyperlordosing dosing events, which uh, for those who are um, deformity surgeons, yeah, it's seen with quite uh, often in neuromuscular cases or in iatrogenic cases. So where does spinal compensation occur? As we saw, most of uh, the pathology tends to be kyphosing, but the compensatory mechanisms are gonna act in both situations. But in a kyphosing deformity, the four, there's gonna be a forward shift of the, gap, of the gravity line. So each spinal segment is gonna have a part of, it is gonna be involved in compensation as much as it can and in a certain moment of time. Globally, in the cervical spines, you're gonna have changes in the curvature or changes in the degree of extension of the head, which is described as the proximal uh, lower doses of the, of the cervical spine. In the thoracic spine, you're gonna have changes in the degrees of kyphosis, but also, and very importantly, it's something that you have to take into account in the x-rays, is you're gonna have a change in the apex and the extension of the curve. So that curve, which usually tends to be around T7, can it shift upward, downward, and the limits of the thoracic kyphosis can shift depending on the situation. And in the pelvis, there are gonna be also changes. Most specifically and most importantly, pelvic retroversion. And at some time, involvement of the lower extremities. So let's see how these things, uh, these compensatory mechanisms work. The most important mechanism or the, mo the one that's usually used the most by the body is pelvic retroversion. So what is pelvic rotation or retroversion? Well, when you talk about retroversion or antiversion, you're talking about a rotation of the pelvis in its own axis, which, can, which is gonna move the relationship of the SVA or the C7 plumb line with respect to the posterior aspect of the first sacral end plate. So when you talk about retroversion, you're talking about a rotational movement that's gonna move the SVA backwards of the posterior corner of the superior sacral amplate. That's retroversion. Antiversion is gonna be the opposite. So when you do antiversion, that C7 plumb line is gonna to tend to go forward. So retroversion, move the this, this C7 plumb line backwards. Antiversion, move the C7 plumb line forward. It's very important to get to have this concept very clear. 
because sometimes it gives you some kind of some confusion. So what are the effects? Well, there's a, one, a very obvious net effect, which comes from its very own name. It's the shift of the, of the C7 plumb line. As you do retroversion, you're going to shift that plumb line backwards. And in like in this photograph, you can see that has a big effect. And that's a very important compensating effect for kyphos and effects. And that is also going to have a transforming effect on the curves or the curvature or the sagittal profile of the spine. Once you start moving or shifting that C7 prom line from frontwards or backwards, the spine is going to move and it's going to change its shape. And once you try to correct, it's also going to tend to change its shape depending on how flexible it is. So once you generate pelvic retroversion, the first effect, the effects are going to go from the pelvis upward. And the first effects are going to be seen on the lumbar spine by changing or diminishing the degree of low doses. And this works both frontward and backward. And otherwise, if you change the position of the pelvis, you're going to change the lumbar lower doses. If you change the lumbar lower doses, then you can shift your pelvis to compensate. So this is how pelvic retroversion works as a compensatory mechanism, for example, for a flat back. You lose lower doses, and then you shift your pelvis to compensate and move that SBA backwards. So what happens uh, with respect to the analysis? Well, you're going to see a shift or a lowering of the sacral slope because the, this, the um, S1 end plate is going to tend to be more horizontal. The pelvic tilt is going to become larger because you're moving the, fe the femoral heads forward. The lumbar lower doses is going to be lower and lower and lower, the more horizontal the sacrum is. And the inflection point of the thoracal lumbar ju junction is going to change usually tending to go down. That also, that's gonna depend as well on the, the actual shape of the thoracic kyphosis and uh, how flexible that thoracic spine is. And so this is what you can see usually. You can, you're not only changing the position of the pelvis, but you're progressively changing or shifting the shape of the spine, making it the straighter, the more retroversion you're making, or shifting more the pelvis as the spine becomes straighter. So it, can, it goes both ways. But there are limits to this, to, to this mechanism. And those limits are basically set by anatomy. So pelvic tilt becomes very important here. Pelvic incidence becomes very important here. The pelvic incidence, as you saw previously, is a fixed anatomical value which shows you the angular relationship between how horizontal the sacrum is with respect to the hip joint. And the larger the pelvic incidence, then you're gonna have more angular possibilities to do uh, to, to retroversion. So you're gonna have a larger reserve. That pelvic incidence is gonna, if you have a large pelvic incidence, you're gonna have more reserve lordosis to lose lordosis or to compensate the loss of lordosis. Therefore, that incidence is going to be your retroversion reserve. And that's a problem with patients that do not have that much reserve. They, they don't have that capability of pelvic retroversion that maybe somebody with a larger curve has. This is something that we see when you see a type 1 or type 2 versus a type 3 or type 4 uh, sagittal profile. But this also has a very big influence on the hips. And the hips have an influence on retroversion as well. The hip joint has both flexion and extension movements. The flexion movement is broadly much larger than the extension movement. But both of these movements are important both, both for posture and for walking. So during hip extension, the limitation is going to be when the, the neck of the femur actually impinges on the posterior part of the labrum of the art articulation of the hip joint. Once that happens, the, the hip cannot extend anymore. When you do pe pelvic retroversion, this is going to start. You're going to start taking away the, capac the capacity of the hip joint for it to extend. Under normal conditions, the femur, the femur, on an upright standing position, the femur should be straight down, and therefore the pelvic the pelvic tilt has no relationship with the hip joint with the with the position of the femur. But under pathological position conditions. If you start retroverting and retroverting and retroverting that, that pelvis, a moment's going to come when you still have 
more capability to do retroversion. That is, you still have slope to lose, but at that moment in time, the femur is already impinging upon the leg on the on the hip joint. At that moment, the only way that you can continue to retrovert is by flexing the hip joint. So in this condition, the the relationship between just the pelvic tilt is going to change. You're not just going to have the the pelvic movement, but you're going to have also the pelvic movement plus the hip flexion. So this is expressed by the pelvic femoral angle. And this is a simple angle which is measured between the long axis of the hip joint and the vertical centered on the hip joint. And in a standing position, once you have exhausted your retroversion reserve with respect to the hip, you're going to start flexing your, fit, your hip joint. And part of the, uh, that PFA is going to be a component of the tilt. So in this condition, when you have already exhausted all your, the extension reserve of the hip, the tilt is actually going to become the sum of the extension of the pelvis or the retroversion of the pelvis plus that flexion of the, of the hip joint, which is the PFA. So in this pathological condition or this extreme compensation uh, situation, the retroversion of the pelvis is going to be comprised of the involvement of the hip and the involvement of the pelvis. So under so this is the this is a bit a problem and why is this a problem? As the as the disease progresses and compensation occurs, you're going to start to have movement on the hips, and this relates to a problem which is called hip spine syndrome. And the same as it goes with respect to retroversion in the spine, it goes both ways. You can have pathology the Extended retroversion of the pelvis can generate problems to the hip, but the limitation of the movement of the hip can also generate problems with the retroversion capacity of the, of the spine, of the hip, and therefore altering the spine. And this is known as the hip spine syndrome. So what happens in some processes like hip osteoarthrosis? Well, with time, you're gonna develop a flex, flexion, flexion deformity of the hips. And the, that extension reserve of the hip joint is gonna be loose less and less and less up to a point where the patient is obligated to flex the hip joint because of the osteoarthrosis and the pain. And this will generate an obligated antiversion of the pelvis. And this antiversion is gonna generate an anterior, an anterior shift of the C7 plumb line. And to compensate that, you're gonna to have to do hyperextension of the spine. So that's going to increase, increase the forces on the posterior elements. And since this is a progress, the process that usually comes with age, usually older people is going to have more problems with their musculature and their articulations and their spinal flexibility to be able to compensate for this phenomenon. Therefore, a hip osteoarthrosis or processes like acetabular dysplasia can shift the gravity line forward and simulate spinal imbalance. And you take, you take a full spine x-ray and you say this patient is unbalanced. The SVA is forward. You, you have a loss of lumbar, a relative lumbar or doses, lower doses and a high uh, slope, but the problem does not underlie in the spine. The spine is trying to compensate, but it can't. The, problem, the underlying process is in the hips. And in this cases, you should first treat the hip joint problem and then evaluate how the spine is afterwards. So this is very important to take into account. And this is what can happen. And this is, you can see this in, in older and also in younger patients. This is a position where you might think that this could be a very severe sagittal imbalance of the spine, but this is a hip dysplasia. Once you correct this problem, the spine will correct itself. And one of the confusing events of the, about this is since the hip joint is, is in problems and the, muscular, the musculature of the hip joint generates pain, this irradiates with a very similar fashion to the L3 root pain. So this can give confusion to think that you may even have root impingement when you actually don't. This is a, a form of referred pain. So this goes the other way around as well. If you have, for example, the case of a hip, a patient with a hip replacement, 
and the surgery was done adequately and the hip joint now works fine, but he has a sagittal imbalance, then you're going to have a forward shift of the gravity line. And that's going to generate retroversion, forced retroversion of the spine. And that forced retroversion of the spine is going to ge generate impingement on the cup, on the cup of the hip replacement. And also it's going to distribute the forces more on the posterior part of the cup. And not treating sagittal imbalance in this patient is, can lead to a premature failure of the hip joint, of, of the hip joint replacement. So it goes both ways. If you have a hip problem that's very severe enough, this can induce sagittal imbalance of the spine. But if you have severe enough sagittal imbalance of the spine, this will conduce to an accelerated degeneration of the hip joint. And as well, if you have a, a, a hip replacement, it can induce failure of the hip replacement. So it is very important that during our evaluation, we also evaluate the mobility of the hip joint. This is a very simple test, the pendulum test, and you just evaluate what happens with the rotation of the hip joint. If there's significant pain or limitation, you should evaluate that movement of the pelvis of the pelvic joint, of the hip joint, and the and the position to see how much flexion of the femur is actually because as a compensation to the spinal problem, or if that flexion of the hip, of the knee of the femur is secondary to a hip problem, and then act accordingly. Just don't ignore that the hips have a very important role in limiting the reserve of the uh, act retroversion reserve of the hip as a part of a compensation mechanism. And this can give to another situation. As we, as we saw in the first talk, this is, we evaluate uh, balance and alignment usually as a, as a picture, as a static element, but we humans are dynamic and we walk. So if you're in that gray boundary line where the hip is just at this, at this extension limit, but you still need more retroversion and you're comp in compensated balance, like in, in the A on the graph, that's okay if you're standing, you're not moving. But when you start walking, you're gonna need to use part of that extension reserve of the hip to be able to move your leg backward during, during the process of walking. If you already exhausted that reserve, when you start walking, then you're gonna obligate the pelvis to go into antiversion. And if that is, if you have an unbalanced spine, then your center of gravity is gonna shift forward during walking. And this is what's called a pseudo compensated spine. It's a spine that's once you take a static full body x-ray, it may seem compensated. It's unbalanced, but compensated. But once the patient starts walking, that imbalance is very noticeable. And those are patients that once, once they start walking, they're gonna have to shift forward or else their, their hip joint cannot move backward during the walking cycle. So it's also important not only to just evaluate the hips, but also evaluate the posture during the walking uh, evolution of the patient. This will tell you that more compensation or more correction may be needed to uh, correct this problem of pseudo compensation. And this also applies to the knees. To be able to do hip flexion, you need to do knee flexion. So if there is a coupling between the knee and the hip, if you have a, a very advanced knee osteoarthrosis, then you're gonna force flexion on the, on the knee joint, which is gonna force flexion on the hip joint, which can force antiversion on the spine and on the, on the pelvis. And that antiversion is gonna heighten lumbar lordosis. But if at the same time you have sagittal imbalance of the spine, then you're gonna have a loss of lordosis or you're not gonna be able to compensate with more lordosis to that ant antiverted spine. And in these cases, then you're gonna have a biomechanical domino effect from the knees upward. And it has been, uh, some studies have shown that with osteoarthrosis, with more than 10 degrees flexion, forced flexion of the knees, you will already start having a shift in sagittal balance of the spine. So in patients who also have advanced knee, ar knee arthrosis, it's a very good idea to treat that first and then reevaluate sagittal balance, especially in those cases where you might have to do a big intervention to correct 
some uh, severe uh, sagittal imbalance. So what happens in the cervical and the thoracic spine? Well, movement is gonna be active both at the segment level, that is between two vertebral bodies and the disc. That's the, fun the functional segment, but also globally in the functional curve. Remember that one thing is the anatomical curve that we know, for, for example, the thoracic kyphosis is T1 to T12. That's anatomical. But functionally, that curve is going to be much larger or much smaller, depending on how the, the sagittal profile of the spine is. That, that's going to be, for example, for the thoracic kyphosis, your, the real kyphosis is going to be between the inflection point between the cervical and thoracic and the inflection point between the thoracic and lumbar. And that's going to be your functional thoracic kyphosis, which can encompass part of the lumbar spine and can encompass part of the cervical spine. So this, these changes are part of the compensation mechanism. If the spine is flexible enough, you can change the curvature, make it less or more, and you can change the inflection point and change the apex, therefore changing the whole sagittal profile. And this can be done both in the thoracic and in the lumbar and in the cervical spine usually in somewhat of a linked faction because each of these curves are connected to each other. But to this, for this to be able to happen, you're gonna to have to have adequate musculature, especially to do, for example, in, thoracic, in the thoracic spine to hyperextend or lose kyphosis, you're gonna need good musculature to do that. You're gonna need a flexible disc and you're gonna need a facet joint that is capable of accepting those movements. If you overload these structures, or with age that you have muscular weakness, uh, facet osteoarthrosis, then those mechanisms are gonna, be, are gonna be lowered and you do not have the same compensation capability that you have in a, young, in a younger patient. And this will translate usually to muscular overload. And that muscular overload will, will either lead to failure or to constant pain. So even, at this very end, once the muscle is also failed, you'll overload the spinal segment, and this will end um, in a mechanical failure, which could be lysis or lysthesis, or in case after surgery, you can even have a PJK, for example. So in the cervical spine, usually what, what do you do? If you have a hyperflexion situation, the, you're going to try to move, the C7 plumb line moves forward, you're, it's going to be a response to lumbar hyperlordosis, to loss of thoracic kyphosis. And it can end with a swan neck because you're going to start moving, moving forward up to the point which the spine becomes straight. You're going to start to kyphose the spine. So that's what we, you see in, uh, in C. Cervical hyperextension will try to move the C7 plan line backwards. And that's going to be in response to a movement of the C7 plumb line forward, be it because of loss of lumbar lordosis or a heightened thoracic kyphosis or a segmental problem which generated a kyphotic event. In the thoracic spine, what happens in case of hyperflexion? The C7 plumb line moves forward and then you're gonna have to do hyperflexion of the spine hyperextension of the spine to move that C7 plumb line backwards. You're gonna overload the muscles, you're gonna overload the facet joints, and you're gonna overload the discs in the posterior aspect. And this can induce retral stasis. If you have hyperextension, that's a compensation mechanism. This is usually gonna happen when you have a hyperlordotic spine, and that's gonna move the C7 plumb line in a different manner. So thoracic hyper, hyperkyphosis will move the C7 plumb line forward. Thoracic lord, hypokyphosis will move the C7 plumb line backward. The most common mechanism will be the loss of thoracic kyphosis, but it's a very large energy dependent uh, mechanism. You do require a very good musculature to try to maintain that. And it's gonna be co constant workload. So in many cases, this thoracic me mechanism of compensation is not only limited because with age, the thoracic spine tends to be much more rigid, but also the musculature is much weaker. Therefore, the limitations of this compensation mechanism have to be taken into account when you are looking at a, um, 
degenerative process with sagittal imbalance. And this is a, a, an example of what can happen. So if you have the patient, like on the first image on the left, he has a flat back, a global flat back. There's still some movement on the thoracic spine. Surgery is done to correct the lumbosacral imbalance, restoring lumbar lordosis. And the response is on the, on the thoracic spine is, again, you have cervical, you reinduce the formation of a thoracic kyphosis. That flattening of the thoracic spine was a compensation to the loss of lumbar lordosis, therefore moving this SVA backwards. By, by changing or correcting the lumbosacral or the lumbopelvic imbalance, correcting lumbar lordosis, then the spine can relax again and generate a thoracic kyphosis, going back to a more balanced or more harmonic shape, maintaining the SVA in a correct position. And this load compensation not only happens on the thoracic spine, it can happen anywhere. And it happens on the lumbar and the cervical spine and especially happens where we start our instrumentation because it's gonna be a high stress point. And when we do lumbar instrumentation, that uh, inflection point of the thoracolumbar lumbar uh, spine is gonna be very important. If we don't take that into account where that inflection point should be or is, then we're gonna, the spine is gonna try to compensate that change in, in curvature right up at the end of your instrumentation. So in this case, you, there's a, a, a surgery done in L4, L5, this space, but the inflection point of the spine was shift, shifted downward immediately above the instrumentation. And that's gonna generate a hyper, a hyper extending force to correct and maintain that, that change in shape. And that will eventually lead to PJK as in failure, as you can see on the image on the left on the right side. So the spine has compensatory mechanisms everywhere. In the thoracic spine, you can hypo, hypo or hyperlordose, like in this case. In the cervical spine, you can hyperlordose to shift the C7.1 line backward. In the lumbar spine, you can change the, you can create in the pelvis, create pelvic retroversion to shift that gravity, that gravity line towards the sacrum, toward the femurs. The knees will do flexion as well as the hip joint will do flexion to try to make a larger uh, retroversion reserve. And in cases where the spine is fixed, that upper segment in many times is gonna have to compensate either by hyperextending or sometimes even slipping if we do not take into account the, the change of the sagittal curvature of the spine. So how, this is how the spine compensates. Now, what happens during the normal aging process of the spinal degeneration? Well, as we did touch a few of these things previously, well, the disc is a major contributor to, the, to, to uh, degenerative disease. You're gonna lose slot height, you're gonna lose flexibility in the discs. And in some cases, if severe enough, you'll actually lose stability because of the disc problems. The facet joints will, try, will be uh, one of the, mechanical compensatory mechanisms to the overload because of the loss of disc height, the, the facets are gonna overload. So you're gonna have hypertrophy and closes of, this, of the facet joints, loss of movement of the facet joints until they fail. Uh, the, muscular, the musculature is gonna be overloaded. So with age, there's a problem. Usually people tend to be more act, more, less active with age and uh, muscle tends to be atrophied easier and they they're gonna have the same resistance. So you're gonna lose muscle mass and muscle strength. You're gonna lose resistance of the muscle fibers. And this all results in a loss of lumbar lordosis, a thoracic kyphosis that tends to be augmented and a lower threshold for functional spinal unit hyperflexion, hyperextension due to the disc degeneration. And this can lead easier to more pain, to more hypertrophy, to more stress on, his, on each spinal segment and eventually even to lysis or listhesis of the segment. This also uh, will reflect in a progressive impairment of the compensation mechanisms in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. And with time, in a change of the spinal morphotype from what you had as a young person, completely balanced, 
And with compensation, your morphotype will change. So how does this change happen or what has been seen up to now? Well, it, first of all, it will depend on your pelvic retroversion reserve. The pelvic incidence uh, is the basis of your curvature or your sagittal profile of the spine. The more incidence you have, there you are the more slope you will tend to have. Therefore, you will have to have a more pronounced lumbar literature, lumbar lordosis to be able to maintain an upright posture. So it all comes from here. That pelvic incidence is going to insinuate what kind of uh, shape your spine is going to be in. But once your spine starts to change, your spine is going to have to rely on the pelvis to compensate that change in the, cha in the shape of the spine. Usually this, the, usually this in, in change in shape is going to start in the lumbar level. So for example, in a type one spine where you have a slope that's less than 35 degrees and all the lumbar lordosis is concentrated on the very last lumbar segment and the very last few lumbar segments, you're not going to have very much capability to compensate the, the loss of that little bit of lordosis that you still have. So once this happens, that type one curve is going to accentuate itself. It's going to try to hyperlordose the little bit it can move at the fine at the very end of the spine. So you're going to have overstress in the lower part of the spine. Since the reserve of retroversion, the retroversion reserve is very low, you're going to start overloading the upper segments. And this is going to, if with time, can induce um, listhesis in the upper segments. And this spine was also, as we saw in the contact force talk, since the shear element is less, the, the compressive force is more, is, is more accentuated. These type of uh, spines will tend to have more uh, disc, uh, concentric disc bulging and a rosary type disc disease versus a listate and anterior listhesis. They'll tend to more to high problems, problems in the higher part of the spine with uh, anterior, with retrolysthesis and disc bulging in a rosary type of form. Until eventually, once you can, you, you have exhausted that little bit of uh, hyperlordosis that you can do in the most part of the spine, a little bit of retro uh, pelvic retroversion that's available, you'll just come into a global kyphosis, otherwise you'll be on balance. So the SVA will irrevocably uh, move forward. The type two will have a little bit more compensation capacity. Still the sacral slope is a little bit is lower, but you do have a little bit more distribution of that lordosis between the L45 and the L5 S1 disk space. But the evolution is gonna, is gonna start to throw, show itself toward a type one or it will start to shift that inflection point upward, trying to generate more lordosis or enlarge the lordosis. And by doing this, you try to, to lordose the upper lumbar segments and move the inflection point of the spine upwards. The problem with that is at the same time that the lumbar spine is degenerating, the thoracic spine is doing that as well. So the thoracic spine will probably not be as flexible as it once was. And this is going to induce overload in the thoracolumbar junction. And this overload in the thoracic thoracolumbar junction is going to be expressed as pain and eventually as a failure of the posterior elements and retrolysthesis. And this is and this can actually go such a way that the thoracolumbar jun juncture tends to become kyphotic. Type three and type four spinal curvatures, since they have a much larger reserve for retroversion, they can do a lot more compensation to the loss of lordosis and the loss of flexibility of the spine centered just on the pelvis, not on the global position of the curvatures and the inflection point. So in a type three and in a type four, what you will tend to see is a change in the sagittal profile from a type three or type four towards a false type two. Why, why a false type two? Well, it's, it is a, if you measure it at that moment in time, it's going to be measured as a type two because you're going to have a low sacral slope. The inflection point is going to be relatively lower, not as low as a native type two, but, and the sagittal curvature is going to be not very pronounced. 
But if you take into account the pelvic incidence of that patient, then you can you can start to see well with this degree of incidence, that patient should not have this amount or this low amount of sacral slope. So there's going to be a altered relationship between the amount of incidence and the amount of slope and therefore the amount of tilt and the amount of lumbar lordosis. And that's where the equations to have an estimation of the amount of lumbar lordosis with relationship to the amount of pelvic incidence come into play. They help you first to identify if that's the native state of that spine or if it's in a compensated state because of the loss of lumbar lordosis. And you, they can also help you to try to plan what to do by having an idea of what the ideal relationship between lordosis and incidence is. So to an analyze the situation, and as you can see here in the type four, basically it's like the evolution from a very large uh, pelvic um, cap retroversion capacity, converting itself from a type four to a type three, to a type two, and then failing as the, as the capability of retroversion is exhausted and then the capacity of the spine to change its shape, its shape is also exhausted. So this is how the spine degenerates. And when you evaluate sagittal balance, you do have to take this into account. First, you want to see how that patient should be in uh, how he is actually in, in, in his clinical setting, how that spine should have been once in, the, once in a lifetime when he was young and everything was okay what the compensatory mechanisms uh, are acting and how they are acting right now and what limitations those compensatory mechanisms have in the present. And with that, you can try to establish a uh, surgical or non-surgical plan to treat the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torres for your lecture and for all the audience for your attention. Now we will continue with the Q&A section. For this, um, for this section, so uh, Dr. Rodriguez is asking, uh, which parameters during spinal compensation are more important to take into account for surgical planning during a balance correcting surgery? Okay, so there, are, as we saw, spinal balance is not a localized problem. Spinal balance is global. It involves the whole of the spine, it involves the pelvis, and it involves the hips, it involves the knees. So you should not only concentrate on one part of the spine. I guess one of the big problems that uh, sometimes you have when you start reading about sagittal balance is that initially most uh, of the published papers concentrated their attention uh, on the spinopelvic parameters. And it's, it is as if you, could, you had a saw and you cut your patient in half uh, at, the, at, the, at the thoracolumbar junction and then you cut off his legs. Patients are whole. So all this information, all these indices, the tilt, the slope, the SVA, the equations, be it Schwab's or the Wex or the ones that are to come that relate the thoracic, the lumbar lordosis with the incidence, or even the, the formula to calculate the estimated thoracic kyphosis to the lordosis. All of these equations, what they do to you, what the, the use are, is for you to understand what's happening. What's happening on a, on a local level and on a global level. And once you understand what's happening in a global situation, the then you can understand what you have to do based on the problem that you have. And this is something that is actually in course. There are still situations where you might have a very loca located problem, let's say a four or five compression, but that patient is somewhat imbalanced. Sometimes in, this, in cases like those, you, we may analyze the balance. It may be unbalanced or in a borderline from compensation to decompensation, but then the solution to that imbalance is gonna be much larger than the actual problem that you have of compression. So you cannot take this as a, as a law that you have to always uh, force correct uh, sagittal 
imbalance or sagittal balance compensation. You have to analyze the situation, see how much compensation is actually occurring, see if that compensation is actually uh, experienced in a negative manner uh, as pain or disability for the patient. Because one thing that I did not name here is the first compensatory mechanism that the patient has that we cannot measure is muscle tone. So to create that, those extension forces in the lumbar spine, you're gonna have to contract the posterior musculature more and more and more and more frequently. And that constant contraction is gonna end up in muscle strain, muscle pain, and intolerance to activity. So, you know, so treating the, the decompensation will lower the amount of force that the musculature has to do, therefore improving lifestyle. But you have to evaluate the whole balance, have a good idea of the situation, not be so centered on numerical values, but interpret the situation based on those numerical values. And once you have that interpretation and an understanding of the situation, then you can progress to plan a surgical or non-surgical strategy. Okay, thank you very much. So in this context of uh, evaluating muscles, how do you evaluate pelvic stabilizing muscles? And how is this important for balance? Well, uh, usually in, in clinic, I do the pendulum test. I see how the knees flex and move. And it, it is a good idea to evaluate the adductors and the gluteus muscles, uh, see how, how, how much weakness they have. That is especially important the older the patient. In young patients, uh, it's not that important, but if they have any alteration in global posture, then the more altered the posture is, the more important the toe muscle, muscular tone is. Uh, if you have um, imbalance in a very initial phase, is when you're starting your treatment and you're start focusing on physical therapy, lifestyle changes, and weight loss, it should be uh, of note to tell the physical therapist not just to work on core muscles and uh, lumbar muscles, but also to try to uh, fortify and uh, treat retractions in the hips, therefore giving the patient more uh, compensation capabilities. Okay, thank you. Um, which spinal osteotomies would you recommend for antiverting a retroverted, retroverted pelvis? When the osteotomies are not designed to antivert or retrovert the, the pelvis, uh, uh, there have been studies uh, done to they actually do osteotomies on the pelvis to, in a way, sheet. Uh, why do I say cheat? Well, if you have, a, if you do an osteotomy on the S1 end plate, then you can actually change the pelvic incidence, which is an anatomical factor. But if you, let's say you do uh, an osteotomy on the S1 end plate and take off 10 degrees on the end plate, you're actually changing the pelvic incidence. Therefore, you're changing the whole relationships of all these uh, angles. But this is alignment. So if you do that, in a way you're cheating. Uh, because you're changing the relationships on a fixed uh, parameter. And then all the other parameters may come into line, but the effective biomechanical change of that is not very well uh, studied. So that impact uh, with trying to change the pelvis to change to uh, not change the spine so much, uh, that's, that's something that I think would still have to uh, be more studies. And uh, well, doing that kind of osteotomy does have its risks. So usually what, what we do is we have the primary event, which is loss of lordosis for degenerative, iatrogenic or other causes. And we're gonna do the osteotomies on the lumbar spine to enable the patient to undo the retroversion that he had to do to compensate. And this comes to, to mind a very important thing is, uh, this is very, very important, especially when you're thinking of instrumenting or treating the L5S1 disc space. Uh, if you're treating, if you're gonna treat that segment, then you're gonna have to be very cautious uh, about taking into account those compensatory mechanisms. Because if for whatever reason you leave the patient under lordosed 
or hyperdosed and you include the lumbar sacral uh, segment, then the pelvis is going to try to antivert or retrovert. All the pelvic muscles are going to be working against your instrumentation, and that will lead to, to failure eventually or pain or both. So uh, that's probably one of the reasons why the spinal segment where you see the highest uh, degree of pseudoarthrosis is L5 S1. So try to preserve that segment as much as you can to enable that movement of that segment to have more retroversion uh, or antiversion as uh, leave that for the patient to compensate. If you do have to treat it, then do take into account uh, the alignment of the spine so then you can put that lumbosacral junction in a, in a place where it doesn't have to much, move much to compensate because the movement is less the more you have to go down. So an angular shift in L5 is one is gonna have a higher impact on the global sagittal profile. Let's say 20 degrees change in, in L5 is one is gonna have a much higher impact on the whole spine that the same angular change or shift let's say at, at L2, L3. So the lower down you go, the more important it is to take into account those small changes because the impact on the global profile is gonna be more. Perfect, doctor. The next question was written by Dr. Osorio and went as follows. In your experience, it is possible to think that sacroiliac sacroiliac joint inflammatory disease is secondary to diseases that change the spinopelvic parameters? Well, uh, the sacroiliac joint, it has, is, we all take it as it does not move in the adults. It does have a little bit of movement and uh, the ligaments do strain themselves. So in certain situations where the patient is frankly unbalanced, um, the stress on these joints is gonna be more pronounced. So there is a correlation between uh, fixed imbalance with uh, lumbosacral fixation and more sacroiliac pain. Uh, but, but the problem is that once that sacroiliac pain uh, ensues, uh, it is not always solved by reverting uh, that situation because that's going to be a whole pathological process in itself. So uh, in a way to try to prevent this problem, it is, is to do take to, uh, into account uh, how the lumbopelvic uh, junction should be and in, uh, in what is your uh, goal with respect to surgery in the lumbosacral junction. Okay, perfect. And this next question was written by Dr. Ramirez and went as follows. During evaluation of a young patient with nonspecific acute cervical pain, you find inversion of cervical lordosis. If no myelopathy or radiculopathy is encountered, how would you proceed in the evaluation of treatment of these patients? That's actually quite an interesting question. Um, for time, uh, for a long time now, we've always thought that, uh, that the cervical spine is lordotic. Um, in this course, we're not treating much about cervical sagittal alignment. But um, what is being seen is that it depends. There are a group or of normal patients without pain, without dysfunction, that may have a lower direct cervical spine, a neutral cervical spine, or a slightly kyphotic cervical spine without that being completely pathologic. So that is something that is still being studied with respect to what is normal with respect to the cervical uh, curvature. But if you do have a pain, what you do usually see in, to some degree is patients that have cervical pain and you do see a hyperlordosed cervical spine, especially when the proximal cervical lordosis is heightened. That proximal cervical, the cervical lordosis is broadly divided in two between the occiput and the first spinal segments and from there downwards. And one, comp, one usually, the, the occipital cervical junction is responsible for the most par, part of the global uh, lordosis. So even though you might have the most part of the, the, the subaxial spine straight, that upper part is gonna be lordosed. And that's the movement of your head up and down. That's how you compensate and maintain the horizontal gaze. 
So once you have to hyperload those the spine, then the posterior elements in the cervical spine are going to be overloaded and the muscles have to be working constantly to maintain that lordosis. And that translates to pain. So sometimes uh, you have these patients and you look at the MRI, there's nothing very special in it, some degenerative K changes, but you do see a spine that is more lordotic and you see the C7 SVA shifted forward. And then you do a full spine X-ray and then you find out that there's something going on below. And that problem sometimes, not always, can have, the, is actually causing an impact, a compensatory mechanism in the cervical spine. And in those cases, treating the uh, imbalance or the lack of lordosis, which is usually the cause, downstairs will fix the problem upstairs. This is something that you also see uh, when you do uh, deformity cases in young patients. Although the, the great majority of, uh, thoracic, of um, adolescent idiopathic uh, scoliosis cases, well, they, they have uh, their, own, uh, their own way of, uh, of working out. But in many cases, you do see with the, the scoliosis, you see some degree of cervical uh, kyphosis. And once you correct the sagittal and coronal profiles, with all the sagittal profile, then the patient goes and generates uh, uh, lower doses in the cervical spine. So that, the, that shows you how the spine is interconnected. But uh, there's not yet a specific uh, mathematical uh, relationship that you can you know, uh, try to stick to. So you, it, it's still a subject of interpreting the, the curves. Okay, wonderful. So I'm afraid we have uh, the last question of this Q&A session. So Dr. Vergara is asking, should we do a panoramic x-rays of the spine in all patients with degenerative spine disease? I think that one of, um, one of the things or one of the difficulties uh, once we study sagittal balance or to study and evaluate sagittal balance is actually not doing it. So first you do have to study uh, understand the basic concepts, but to be able to understand this, you do need practice. So where does that practice come from? It can't come from a course like this one or the uh, case study that we're gonna do next. It has to come from your daily practice. So the only way for you to start to get an insight and eventually develop an intuition on how the spinal balance is and understand it is to actually measure it and interpret it. And to do that, you do need a full body x-ray. Um, right now, uh, in our centers, uh, we are trying to, to have full body x-ray on every single patient, if possible. And that will give, you, give us an insight on both, be it the patient has a balanced or unbalanced or compensated balanced state. But that also not only serves as a very good and important tool to evaluate the patient, but also as a teaching tool for ourselves and our residents. Okay, doctor. So thank you for your intervention. And we thank all our participants for being with us today. Our third lecture has come to an end. And in a few minutes, we will be starting our fourth and last lecture by Dr. Leonardo Laverde. Please remember this next lecture will be presented in Spanish. We have an instant 